Good evening. I'm Siwapili Rose Amador LeBeau, and this is Native Voice TV. Welcome to the show. Today, we have with us Antonio Gonzalez. Anto Antonio is the director of AIM West. Welcome, Antonio. Thank you. And Dr. Melinda Miko, and you are a professor at Mills College. Yes, I am. Welcome to both of you. Today's subject is going to be on mascoting, and I'm going to start with reading a letter to you. I've been telling you we have a, a site on Facebook, and I actually got a message on Facebook from one of our, I don't know, well, I can't say our viewers, she's from <laughs> Illinois, I don't know how she heard about us, but she did, and she wrote me this letter, so I'm going to read you the letter, and then we'll talk a little bit about mascoting and how it impacts na Native people. So it's, my name is Sochi Sandoval. I'm a member of the Native American Indigenous Student Organization and the current president of Campus Spirit Revival at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Being that you're the host and executive producer of Native Voice TV, was wondering if you would be willing to collaborate with us on educating people on the issue we are facing with the retired chief mascot. The mascot was retired in 2007, being so last semester Campus Spirit Revival was formed, and a contest was created where students and alumni could submit ideas for a new symbol. We were working under the assumption that people understood why the chief was retired. However, we were proven otherwise when pro-chief people created Stop Campus Spirit Revival and began to fight to either bring the chief back or force the, uni force the university to remain without a symbol. From here, we partnered with a Native American Indigenous student organization to both push forward on electing a new symbol as well as educating people as to why the chief is psychologically damaging to Native people and how it trespasses on our rights to decide how we want to be represented. And Dasuka Mati, thank you, from Sochi Sandoval. And based on this letter, I contacted Antonio because AIM has been very involved in the issue of mascoting for many years. And as a result, he did speak with Sochi. He had her on his radio show, and I understand you had a show on this issue. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your conversation with her and, and your uh, radio show? Thank you. Yes, I, I called and I spoke uh, with Sochi. And uh, currently, they are in discussions with the administration and uh, basically the organizations, the student organizations there, uh, feel that the administration is somewhat lagging or not as enthusiastic as the students would want them to be to address uh, this issue. Uh, replacing uh, uh, from the former mascot to a current one is still uh, in uh, a pending uh, state and uh, they'd like to have this uh, taken care of but uh, it seems like the administration is somewhat lagging. So it started with the mascot being the chief and then they finally got the administration to do away with it and they thought okay we'll have a campaign to bring a new one and the and everyone's coming back saying we want the chief back right? Yes I think because also uh, from 2007 to the present, there was very little uh, effort to educate the students or incoming students. Mm -hmm. uh, and in not doing that, uh, the, the, uh, the problem keeps resurging and, uh, and the, uh, the backlash, as it were, uh, from the students that want to keep uh, the chief. And this is why uh, they're at this uh, impasse right now. Now, I know a lot of people in our audience might say, well, what's wrong with that? You know, we have uh, the Redskins, Washington Redskins. You know, we can't take that away. That's been here forever. Well, that's, a, that's the, the Redskin uh, is the R word for us, uh, similar to the N word for the African peoples. And uh, this uh, uh, issue uh, keeps rising up and uh, there are efforts to address the, the Washington team, uh, including a newly introduced uh, uh, bill in the House of Representatives, it's H.R. 1278. Maybe we can talk about that mm -hmm. uh, later into the program. I'd like to. And uh, um, letters have been sent to the Washington team 
uh, by even members of the, uh, the uh, FCC uh, and also the former director of the FCC uh, directly to the Washington owner, Dan Schneider, that uh, it, it's, uh, it's a slanderous uh, name and logo and, uh, and uh, that they should now be considering to change that as well. Dr. Miko, why do you think people just think it's it's okay? It's okay to to use Native Americans as mascots. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's a long history. I mean, it goes all the way back to the Boston Tea Party, where the improved order of the Red Man um, was trying to resist against colonial oppression from the British, and they decided to dress up as Mohawks and go on there. So uh, this performative nature of mascotting kind of started at that point, but the other, I think, insidious part of it was um, this notion that these fraternal organizations, including the Gordian Knot in the 1800s, and then the, um, it became the Order of the Red Men instead of the Improved Order, and they started making up a fictitious Indian language and names for themselves, and it became a way for them to perform as Indians without mm -hmm. being Indians. And this is really a marked time of extermination of Native people. And that was, you know, followed certainly by the um, Wounded Knee Massacre in 1890, but there were, they really thought, well, how can we exterminate them? Um, one of the logical steps to that was it cost too much to exterminate all these people. Now let's just send them to boarding schools. So you have this notion that there's a vanishing Indian that they're not going to be around very much longer, and who does it hurt to take on these these images? And it, it's detrimental not just to Native people; it's detrimental to non-Native people to um, share in that kind of performance that wouldn't be permitted for any other ethnic group. That is so true. I just saw something on Facebook, and it was a picture of Sambo when they mm -hmm. had Little Black Sambo, and they had the restaurant chain Sambo. Yes. And there was the character, and it's mm -hmm. next to the Cleveland Indian one, saying, why is this one mm -hmm. right. not okay, mm -hmm. and this is okay? Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's acceptable. And I, I know we had a picture of the, uh, the Cleveland Indian, and maybe we could find it there to put it up on the screen, but it's, you know, very demeaning, very demeaning, and people, think it's okay to do the chop at the, you right. know, at the games mm -hmm. and, you know, they think, oh, it's just fun. And the first thing they say is, well, there's the fighting Irish. Uh, but that was chosen by them. I mean, that is coming from within the group, and certainly there's some Native people who support these mascots and don't see the harm in that, but do we let some people say it's okay and then give that? Permission, it's really tied to capitalism too. It's tied to a commodification of an image. So the reluctance of the Washington team or the Cleveland team or any other team really is tied very tightly to trademark and it's tied to the money that they gain from that. And I, I think in some ways the controversy for it feeds their coffers. So why would they, why would they change? Uh, I think the other part is, well, this is honoring. Um, if you're honoring somebody, you ask them how they wish to be honored and not make assumptions. Well, Tony, I think my, my understanding is that this, even this, this chief is a made up one, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes it is. And uh, uh, I'd like to add that uh, the change that, uh, of, with colleges, universities, of changing the mascots, such as uh, Stanford, for Stanford, example, right, right. was took the lead on that back in 72. Uh, but still there are universities that continue. And uh, here in California, the um, we've gone be the, before the State Board of Education and and uh, we didn't get that much of a response on that level. They, they generally uh, defer it to uh, local uh, school district level, let the school districts make those decisions, and if we're going to do that, then uh, we, we won't make the changes that, that we want to make immediately. As it is, we have gone before several local school boards, and uh, we managed to change them, but just like what's happening with the University of Illinois, the, the backlash, uh, alumni come back and they want to reinstitute what was changed, so we just keep going around uh, in a cycle. But I, I think uh, 
we are moving forward. There are uh, uh, colleges and high schools that are making the change uh, on their own, but uh, uh, we need more uh, people to, to get involved in this issue to, to make the change. How can someone get involved? Well, uh, they can go to our website and, and see uh, what we're up to. For example, in San Francisco, the the Giants will, will be, and we are for the Giants, by the way, Yay. but they are mm -hmm. playing a team uh, like the Atlanta Braves, and they're going to be here in the Bay Area in San Francisco, June 9, 10, 11, and 12. And, and uh, we'd like to invite the public to join us to educate uh, the people that come to the stadium of, of how we feel about uh, sports teams such as uh, the Braves. And uh, that's not to let the city of San Francisco off the hook either because we feel that they're implicated, uh, they're complicit uh, in this by perpetuating it mm -hmm. and allowing the selling of merchandise that is very derogatory, very negative uh, uh, images about Indian people. So, uh, and also internationally, uh, aside from the United Nations at UNESCO coming out with a study that it's harmful uh, for indigenous peoples and, and the young people, uh, the United Nations General Assembly uh, uh, passed, adopted a declaration on the rights of the world's indigenous peoples in September of 2007. And within that declaration, there are 46 articles, uh, one of which is uh, Article 8, uh, that specifically uh, addresses uh, the issue of uh, that is demeaning or negative images of Indian people should not uh, be allowed. So we hope that this declaration that has been signed, uh, adopted by the, the entire world community, of course, the United States being the last one mm -hmm. uh, in uh, 2012, December 2012, President Obama announced that they are uh, supporting and endorsing uh, the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So we hope that that put some emphasis to our desire to remove uh, these negative images of Indian people. It really affects the young people, our, our children as well. And uh, we don't have to go so much into the social aspects, but we have the highest uh, suicide rate as well. So uh, we feel that this is contributing factor, that uh, their parents are being laughed at every Sunday or whenever these sports teams come to our cities to play. Right. Now, uh, Doctor, can you tell me, is, is this an issue or a uh, topic that has ever been brought up in any of your classes? And if so, Absolutely. what is the reaction of the students? Um, I, I think a little bit of shock, because mainly I have non-Indian students. There's mm -hmm. a very small native population at Mills College. And I taught a course, which is a required seminar course for all of our sophomore, which has been eliminated, the, the requirement. But I taught a course called Images and Icons. And I um, used a really well-written book by Phil Deloria, Playing Indian, and going all the way back to show him this trajectory that existed and, and what it meant. And particularly with the chief, um, as Tony was talking about, some of those symbols that were used uh, ahead meant where they were going to be able to pay bounties for scalps. And certainly California has a horrendous history of bounties given for scalps of people. So if you connect that to the genocide of Native people and use that as a symbol to somehow um, remember Native people, it's very derogatory. So I, I think most of the, the students in the class, when I would present all kinds of images, uh, sometimes it was absolute um, shock. Oh, how could we do this and why is this allowed and why haven't um, we talked about this? And I had one student um, say, look, this class or these classes like this, educating, because I'm the only tribally enrolled native pr professor on that campus. And so all the questions come to me about native things or, or events. And they said, this should absolutely be a requirement for graduation. You cannot be an educated person without knowing the history of this country and without knowing about indigenous people. So I think a lot of it is shock and then anger. Mm -hmm. And then I think it goes to what can I do? And I said, well, you can do part of what we need, which is coalition building, which is alliances, because only when we have 
that body of people that see this is not just a denigration of indigenous people, but of all people. It's a denigration of humanity. Good point. Now, Tony, you mentioned going to your website. What is that website? Uh, www.aimwest.info, I-N-F-O. Okay, I know, but tell our audience what AIM West is. Uh, AIM West is an uh, uh, organization, nonprofit based in San Francisco. We are intertribal, and uh, we seek to promote and protect the rights of Indian peoples and to educate the public uh, about uh, the issues that we have, for example, with sacred sites or uh, language barriers and how, how to involve uh, more language uh, and uh, local issues, getting people involved. Right, and it's the American Indian Movement. It's an affiliate of the American Indian right. Movement, yes. Now, Tony, you were talking about the bill, and I believe um, Congressman Mike Honda signed on to that bill, our local congressman. Tell us about the bill. Well, yes, uh, by uh, Congressman uh, Faleo Fanega uh, from Guam, and uh, he supports uh, the issues that Indian people are, are bringing to his attention. And uh, this bill, uh, 12, H.R. 1278, uh, seeks to, uh, to put limits uh, on the trademark of names such as the Redskins uh, because of, of its negative imagery and slur of Indian peoples that it represents. So uh, uh, as it was introduced, now it's the organizing uh, to gain uh, the congressional votes to put that forward. I might add that uh, here in California, it was before uh, the legislators, uh, and it passed both uh, the Senate and the Assembly in 2004 during the administration of Governor Schwarzenegger, and it went to his desk, and uh, he literally laughed uh, at the bill and uh, said uh, something like, you must be kidding me. You know, uh, I don't see anything wrong with this. And he just uh, let it die on, on his desk. So uh, we hope to go reintroduce uh, similar legislation, mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, Governor Jerry Brown uh, will consider it. We hope both the Assembly and the Senate uh, will pass unanimously and move forward at that end. We would hope so. Well, that's when we get back to education. Our mm -hmm. governor was uneducated. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly so. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's so true. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, Dr. Miko, um, mm -hmm. what, uh, how would you portray the impact it does have on Native people, Native children, mm -hmm. to see these images? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, for instance, my grandson the other day was doing some silly little war thing he saw, and I stopped him dead in his tracks and said, well, where did you hear that? Our people don't do that. I want to know. He said, from Scooby-Doo. And I thought, okay, at a very, and he's not allowed to watch television. It's carefully monitored. But even at that very young age and knowing about our tribal background and how proud he is, still he's been heavily influenced by the media. So I think what it does is they don't see a positive image reflected back when they look at these mascots. It doesn't represent anything they know from their family or from their tribe or from their, their ceremonies. And not only is that um, a, a dissonance for them, but it's a mockery of what they know are appropriate and sacred ceremonies that really aren't to be shared with the mainstream population. They're very specific and, and tribally, um, and uh, tribal people in, take part in that and people aren't, outsiders don't come into that, that realm. So I think what it does is self-esteem. We have some of the highest dropout rates um, in education. And usually that starts, one would think maybe high school, college, whatever, it's about nine. Now nine years old is when they have an awareness of I'm different from my outside person and what is mainstream say about me and how is that reflected. And that's when you get, and Tony mentioned too, our high rates of suicide. And we don't know how much of that is embedded in the self-esteem of children and what they see reflected in very erroneous messages. I, you know, Hollywood has been a great creator mm -hmm. of those very flat images of Native people and um, has probably done more. So what we know as mascots, as mascots have been atomized to the Plains image. 
And a lot That's of the right. things that are being used as mascots have to do with plains people. The landscape is probably in Monument Valley, but that imagery really is plains people. So that stands in for over 500 nations with diverse languages, cultures, ceremonies that people don't understand. I often, students say, well, what happened on contact? Why didn't you all get together and fight everybody off? And I said, I have two words for you, Palestine and Israel. That is the same land base and that same conversation. They're two separate nations with two different ideologies. We're 500 nations with different ideologies and some of our traditional enemies, but we don't have to be united because we're separate and we're distinct. We, we want to maintain that distinction and it's hard in the face of all of that media and the onslaught. And at the very, very young ages for children are seeing this is disastrous to their self-esteem. Wow. Yeah, I'd like to add that uh, <laughs> Dr. Miko, I think, hit it on, on the head that uh, in, in terms of the culprit, so to speak, and that being the media, uh, plays a, a big part in educating mm -hmm. uh, the country today. And uh, the, the, the code of ethics hasn't really been established within these journalists, evidently, because uh, what they've managed to do is to be a part of this institutionalizing uh, the racism that we're confronted with today, mm -hmm. including the images that Hollywood uh, mm -hmm. is producing. And I might add even the Department of Defense with all this military oh, yes. uh, arms uh -huh. and machinery, mm -hmm. the, the helicopter, the Apache, <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the Tomahawk missile, mm -hmm. and uh, even the naming of uh, uh, Obama, uh, uh, Osama. Uh, Osama bin Laden as uh, 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 Geronimo, which is sacred uh, a warrior in our mm -hmm. community, uh, you know, all this adds to this uh, uh, form of discrimination and racism that uh, that uh, separates and, and and makes a distinction of who they're uh, they're uh, teasing or demeaning mm -hmm. in in this way. Can, can I add something to that too, Tony? Um, in all the wars, including the present one in the Middle East. When they're going into territory, unknown enemy territory, it's called going into Indian country. I know. I know. And that's still us versus them. I know. And if we're still using that language to depict, we're still perpetual enemies to the United States or enemies within the border. And I was looking too when I was doing research for this um, show about any other community internationally that's been degraded in the same way. And the only ones I came up with were Muslims who have been equal, equalized to terrorists. But I really, I was looking for any other ethnic group, Sami, I knew I could not find any other people that have been denigrated to this extent. And also I think through Hollywood and some of the media, that's been projected in the international realm so that people outside are playing Indian, you know, in that's Germany, true. Czechoslovakia. So you keep it repeating cyclical, and then they come to the United States looking for those real Indians and looking for the prototype, and they don't find. We had a, uh, you probably know her, woman veteran on the show, and she was saying they would be in their meetings and they'd be talking about, you know, the en enemy territory, Indian country. And, you know, she's like, <laughs> here she's fighting for our country. She's Native American, and they're referring to enemy territory as Indian country. Hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, so it's... Well, I'm, I'm a Vietnam veteran myself, and I was there in 69, mm -hmm. and, uh, 68 and 69, and I walked in the point element. And I was put in that position because Indians or Chicanos are supposed to be alert and more aware of everybody. So it goes into that too. So we're even put in dangerous situations because we're supposed to be able to figure it out faster. Have you seen any improvement in the school systems on education as far as Native Americans go? You know, I, I would like to think there's a little bit of improvement, but I always ask my students, what did you learn in fourth grade? Mm -hmm. The fourth grade, particularly in California schools, are the missions. And what did you learn, what did you, what did you know? Because it's been a long time since I was in the fourth grade. And most of them say, you know, we're learning the same thing. So I said, we're, we're making dioramas of the mission 
and I said, well, this is really akin to making a concentration camp, whether it's a Nazi one or whether it's a Japanese internment camp. That is akin to what this is. And also the way they use it, it sounds almost benign that California natives went to the mission mm -hmm. to work and weren't conscripted. And also even the use of slavery, it gets very touchy in that area that people don't want to assign that label to what was done in mission schools. And I think that we, it's, so it's still there and somewhat discouraging. And I see students feel a little bit of anger. These are non-native students mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about why was I sold this bill of goods? And why is it I had to go to college in order to find out some reality here? And I said, I can't speak to that because we had a coalition of graduate students and professors when I was a student at UC Berkeley to change the curriculum, to alter it, and there was such a, a pushback against that because again it's tied to, to consumerism and to the money that's invested in textbooks, which is All a big right. industry, right. and changing that, what they might see as a minority position, but it really isn't. This is about the United States and how is it formed in opposition to indigenous people. So it's not a revisionist history, which is one way to really devalue it. It is really a comprehensive history. And what harm would it be to hear all of the other stories of this? Wow, I think we just touched the tip of the iceberg, but mm -hmm. uh, I wanna thank Sochi Sandoval for bringing this to light so we could talk about it on the show. Um, it's something we had been wanting to talk about yes. for a while. Mm -hmm. But thank both of you for your contributions you. to this topic. And I would hope you at home would educate yourself to this whole issue of mascotting and think about it. It's not just, don't just take it for granted. Well, that team's been there for a long time. Um, there's a lot more to it. And come out June 8th, 9th, and 10th? 9, 10, 11, 12. Yes, and help out. And uh, like us on Facebook. We'll see you again next uh, uh, Sunday.